Okay, okay, cool. So welcome uh, to our Blended Finance for Climate Tech webinar, where we will be discussing the funding structure that climate startups need to unlock scale. This discussion is kicking off a partnership between SAIS, which is South Africa's leading tech enablers and ecosystem builders. For those of you who don't know, SAIS is South Africa Innovation Summit. And uh, the partnership is then with SAIS and Holocene, the leading early stage climate venture capital firm, venture capital firm in Southern Africa. Holocene and SAIS are partnering to bring you the first climate tech track at the annual SAIS conference in September. The SAIS 2024 climate track boasts speakers, workshops, events, startups, and funders exclusively focused on climate tech in Africa. I will pop the SAIS and Holocene website details in the comment section. Today's discussion is led by Joshua Romisher, who is the CEO of Holocene. So down here, you can see his name. <laughs> and uh, uh, Josh is presenting alongside blended finance expert Akif Merchant from Convergence. And then we are also joined by Michael Mass, the founder and CEO of Zimmy, who will be sharing his first-hand experience with Capital Stack Solutions as a climate tech entrepreneur in Africa. I'm Kaylin, also from Holocene, and I will be the moderator today. And just before we begin, I just want to lay a few house rules lay down a few house rules. So first of all, this webinar is recorded and will be made available to everyone who signed up. And uh, the agenda for today, we are kicking off with a conversation with Akif and then Josh, and then followed by a Q&A between Josh and Michael. Then we will open the floor for questions for the audience. So to our audience members, you will see that you cannot comment, you cannot put your camera on, you cannot put your mic on, nothing. It's because you are on a setting called viewer. If you throughout this webinar have a question, then you can just press on that little hand at the bottom and uh, that will make a little note on the side. So when we get to the Q&A section, I'm going to um, give you access to being a contributor where you can just pop your question in the comment section and we, I will then give that to Josh and Akif and Michael to answer. But I will uh, remind all of you to do that when, once we get to the Q&A session. So uh, before we begin, any questions from our hosts? Michael, Akif, Josh, you're all good? OK. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Akif. Let me just uh, share my screen for your presentation. Great, great. Thanks. Just to confirm, can you hear me and see me clearly? Yes. Excellent. So um, we're going to start with um, a presentation around the first principles of blended finance. This session mm -hmm. is about blended finance for climate tech, but I think it's important first to get the an understanding of blended finance before we actually speak about how it might relate um, to climate tech. Um, so, Kellen, while you pull the presentation up, um, um, yes. Just looking for, I think this one. Yeah, no worries. Is it? Hmm. Seems like I don't it. see it up. You don't see it up. It says an error. That's fine. I can I can do without. I can do without. Can do without. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No worries at all. Okay. Um. Okay. So I think I got what, ten minutes. Yes. Uh, 10, 15 okay. minutes. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Great. Um. So, what is blended finance? Um. I guess. The answer to some degrees in the name. Um, blended finance is essentially the use of concessional money or soft money or money from foundations, donor agencies, philanthropy. So it's the use of that concessional and soft money that's being deployed with the ex express intent and purpose of mobilizing private capital that's sitting on the sidelines, that's not being uh, channeled to climate tech or to other SDGs um, across a variety of different geographies. So essentially, when we take limited, scarce, concessional money and use that in a creative way to mobilize and to draw in that commercial money that's sitting on the sidelines, that is essentially what blended finance is all about. Now, blended finance in and of itself is a financial structuring approach. 
You may have heard of impact investing. That's a common uh, term that people use these days. Impact investing is an investment thesis. It's an investment philosophy. I want to invest in X because I want to achieve impact through that investment pro process. So blended finance is a financial structuring approach. You may or may not have impact investors within a blended finance transaction. Not all blended finance transactions need to have an impact investor within them. So you might have, for example, uh, the Gates Foundation mobilizing um, a couple of private equity firms or a couple of institutional investors into a particular transaction. No impact investor there. Um, you may have heard of public-private partnerships as well. Public-private partnerships are essentially a contracting approach. They're nothing more, nothing less than a contracting approach. It's when you look at the details of the contract and you discern, is there some concessionality embedded within the contract? Only then does it fall within the realm of blended finance. So coming back to first principles, blended finance is a um, financial structuring approach. Impact investing is an investment philosophy. It's an investment thesis. And uh, public-private partnerships is a contracting approach. May or may not have blended finance embedded within it. Now, the unique aspect about blended finance is if you've got pure concessional donor money on one side and commercial money on the other side, and you've got sort of impact investors and a spectrum of impact investors in the middle. Um, all these kinds of investors, all these forms of funding have different risk appetites, different time horizons, different return expectations, um, and different ticket sizes, as an example. Um, the unique aspect of blended finance is it brings all these different investors into one particular structure while ensuring that each of these investors maintains a risk return profile that's acceptable to them. We're not drawing in private commercial capital and asking private commercial capital to behave like philanthropic capital. We're not bringing in philanthropic capital and asking philanthropic capital suddenly to behave like commercial capital. So in a blended structure, you'll have different forms of capital, different forms of funding, where each institution takes on a risk return profile that's acceptable to them. So we're not asking them to change their stripes. Now, what, why are we blending? What is the purpose and objective of blending? We all work in, in emerging markets. You guys are all based in South Africa. I guess most of the people on this call are interested in Africa in one way, shape, or form, dialing in from across the continent. I don't need to tell you, but there's a litany of risks when it comes to investing across the continent, from liquidity risk to currency risk uh, to political risk to every other sort of risk. In so what we're essentially doing through blending is we're trying to reduce the risk or shift the risk and put the risk onto somebody else who's more willing to take on that risk, or we're trying to enhance or increase a return. Ultimately, reducing the risk or shifting the risk and increasing the return brings the risk-adjusted ratio in line with what private investors are looking for, because that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to mobilize those investors. They make decisions or capital allocation decisions based on a risk-return paradigm. So we either have to shift the risk spectrum or shift the return spectrum. That's essentially what we're trying to do with blended finance and using this concessional money. Now, when we looked at, uh, and Convergence, uh, the organization that I represent, um, has a database of around 1,200 deals that have reached financial close and are blended. Half those transactions have taken place in the continent of Africa. And a good proportion, I believe around 30 odd percent, are focused on energy and climate. So energy and climate is a really, really important space um, when it comes to blended finance, because that's really where all the donors are putting in their scarce concessional money and looking to mobilize or the private capital that's sitting on the sidelines and not being invested in this particular space. Now, there's two ways to think about blended finance. You can think about it at a point in time. You can think about it today. I've got a fund structure or I've got a project finance transaction. Let's imagine that's an independent power project. And I'm bringing in different forms of capital and blending um, at the balance sheet level for a particular project or at the fund level for a particular fund. That's blending at a point in time. But for organizations that are on this call, any of them startups. You can also think about blending as a concept that takes place across time. So you might have 
you might join an accelerator and you might get a grant to join that accelerator. The accelerator puts you through the program. You might come out of the program and you might then essentially get a repayable grant. A grant where if you hit certain impact milestones or certain business metrics, you have to pay it back. And then at a later point in time of the business life cycle, you might raise equity for your investments. But the investor saying, you know what? I'm going to give you equity, but I'm going to, I'm going to cap my dividends, or I'm going to ch change the parameters of my investment such that it's non-market in orientation. And then once your business continues to scale, you then might ac access debt capital at a much later point in the, in the life cycle. So blending can be thought about at a point in time, but most importantly for this conversation, also across the life cycle. And it's not very obvious when you think about it across the life cycle, because an investor that's might be coming in at a much later stage and providing your enterprise with debt might not know a lot of the de-risking work that's gone into to bringing the business to the point of investability um, and, and to where they're at at the moment. So I just wanted to impress upon you some of these concepts um, because you may have heard of these terms, but it's helpful just to go back to basics um, and to unpack some of these concepts uh, before we have Josh take these concepts and apply to the climate uh, climate tech world. So with that, uh, I'll stop here and uh, hand it to you, Josh. Awesome, thank you. Teed me up very, very well. Thanks so much for that. It's, it's it's perfect, and I think getting back to first principles is is a great way to do this. And and I mean, it is a, a term that gets thrown around a lot, blended finance. And thanks, Akif, for really helping us understand exactly what that means. So let me see if I can share my screen here. Hopefully that works. Cool. There you go. And can everyone see that? Beautiful. Cool. So I'm going to take 10, 15 minutes now and, and, and walk you through the nuances of how this works, then get to have a bit of a conversation with Michael, who has been an entrepreneur who went through this process. So you'll start to see it from his perspective as well. Um, and before I start, I, I want to say I've learned all this by being an entrepreneur myself. So I was a uh, CFO of a couple of relatively large climate tech companies across Pan-African companies. And so um, this was all learned through blood, sweat, and tears. And I'll start with the story. I'll start with the, the story of my first experience with blended finance. So I was working in banking, doing a lot of the stuff that Akif mentioned about really segmenting risk and return, but within CDOs, CLOs, the whole grab bag of acronyms that, that was part of that financial crisis. And this was a lot of the, the structuring that allowed to move risk around, but obviously led to some adverse consequences as well. Not my fault, but part of the experience. Um, so I leave Wall Street. I go to my first climate tech startup in Africa. We were nearing Series A, super exciting. We're now going to a second market. Everyone's really excited about this startup. And I get in there as the VP of corporate finance. So my job is to help figure out how to create an overall um, financial structure within the organization that makes sense. So on day one, I walk in and I'm super excited. Let's get this thing going. And I talk to my CEO and he says, um, by the way, we need to raise about $8 million of debt right now um, to fund our working capital. Can you do that? So I went home that night and that's not a picture of me, but and there was less less of this and more tears. Like literally I've been dating my now wife for about two months and I went home and I, I literally cried. I was like, I don't know how we're gonna raise $8 million in the better part of a month or two in order to make this business viable, in order to bridge the gap necessary in order to, to fund our working capital. And so you're gonna hear this over and over again in this presentation. When you're doing climate tech, the odds are there's more stuff in your company than just moving of electrons or software, right? There's gonna be solar panels, there's gonna be, uh, in Michael's case, an EV charger. There's going to be something in your business that needs to be financed. So I remember going home that night and saying, man, this seems like a daunting task, $8 million in the better part of two months. How do we raise that capital? But you know what, as an entrepreneur, you have to get it done. So we got it done, it happened. We, we, we raised $8 million of debt. Cool, everyone's celebrating. We can now fund all of our inventory. We can sell more. The company can expand. That's wonderful. And next conversation with the, the leadership team is, we need to raise more equity. <laughs> so like, oh boy, like the 8 million bucks is in the bank, but now we need to raise more, more capital to expand. We wanna go to a second market. We need more cash. So it, it's one of these where 
I think the big takeaway is to be obviously very strategic and to really think about, okay, what kind of capital do I need to raise? Who do I raise it from? And that comes back to blended finance. Blended finance is a very fancy way of saying, if you're running a business, what type of capital are you using in order to fund different assets within your business? As Akif mentioned, there's a timing aspect of all this. There's a really a good understanding of, of risk and return, all these things necessary. So in a lot of ways, that was a success story. We did raise the equity, we did expand, but I wish I would have learned a lot of the things I'm gonna hopefully go through today. This was seven, eight years ago. So first and foremost, what were the lessons learned from that blended finance experience? If you are building a climate tech startup in Africa, if you're building really anything in Africa, assume it's gonna take longer than you expect. Uh, Michael will tell you how long he's been working at just trying to get this thing to market, get the first customer, make the first sale, do all these things. It takes a while. It really does. So whatever you think it's going to take you in order to do the work, multiply it by two or three. And so what does that mean? It means you need to bootstrap, which means being really creative about how you fund the business before you bring in any investors. It means you need more runway. Runway is a fancy way of saying you have enough time to figure out the business model. And you need to really understand your cash flow. And we can get deeper into the ways to do that and the ways to figure out how to bootstrap and how to extend runway and how to really understand your cash flow. But as an entrepreneur, really consider those things as you're starting your business or growing your business. Secondly, remember that when you sell equity, so selling equity means you're selling shares in your company, those, those shares for one are very, very expensive because there are only so many of them. But when you sell equity, you're, you're generally making a big promise to somebody. You're saying to them, hey, I can take your $1 and turn it into five within five years or something along those lines. I'm going to open a new market. I'm going to start a new product. I'm going to go to a different customer segment. So when we talk about blended finance, remember that when you sell equity, you're effectively making a big promise. And those big promises are usually pretty expensive. So you want to make those promises at the right time to the right people for the right things, for the right reasons. And again, blended finance is going to be a way to ensure that you are able to do so. And last piece is, and I really, really high, highly recommend this within, within climate tech, is you have to start this early. You can't get to series A and say, oh, now we're going to blend capital. You really can't wait on this thing for a number of different reasons that we'll talk about today. It's going to take longer than expected. It's definitely very nuanced. And if you start this process too late, it may mean that you're just frankly not gonna own the business by the time you actually get to any level of scale. So those are some hard lessons learned from scaling two climate tech companies that did have working capital, receivables, they were very complex companies, but those were some really good lessons learned. So what does this thing actually look like in practice? And I always wanna be very, very practical. And please, if you have questions, write them down. Um, we'll talk to Michael about this and how he's actually utilizing blended capital in his startup, but then we'll take some Q&A at the end. So please write them down and we'll think about this more as we go forward, because the most important thing today is to walk away with something you can put into practice. So here's what typical fundraising looks like in Africa. So these are actually the, the average numbers for venture capital in Africa. So if you're raising, usually bootstrapping, you're gonna put either some founder equity in or do something, and that usually costs about $100,000. Ideally, you have enough money to be able to bootstrap for long enough. It might even be not taking a salary. So this could be not putting money in, but also not taking money out. So think about bootstrapping as that, like you're just trying to get some, to some place where you could bring in an external investor. The average pre-seed round in Africa, based on historical data, is about 250,000 US dollars of equity. I'm gonna use, uh, sh sorry, I should be a K, not an M. Um, so I'm gonna use USD for all of this. So on average, you're, you're bringing in about $250,000 of equity at pre-seed, on average about $1 million of capital at seed, and $8 million of capital at Series A. I wanna note that this data is primarily based on FinTech. FinTech has been, the most uh, venture capital invested asset in Africa over the last 10, 15 years. Climate tech and fintech are coming together, but historically it's been mostly fintech and therefore these numbers for climate tech may be smaller. So let's just think about that. So these are the average numbers. And you notice there's only one type of capital that you're really raising. And this is primarily for commercial things like, like fintech or property tech, or maybe like a, a consumer marketplace for goods you might not get access to different types of capital. So here's what your capital stack looks like. Now let's get complicated, right? Let's, get, let's make this thing more fun. This is like the fun financial puzzle that is, is the work of a CFO and is also the work of a CEO, I'm gonna say at an early stage startup. 
So if we're talking about climate tech, I really want to impress upon people, there's at least five different types of capital that are part of the climate tech capital stack. There's five different ways to fund your business. One is through grants, and Akif mentioned this. So being able to bring in whether they're repayable or just full on grants. So grants are a type of capital. Human capital, so at Holocene, we invest human capital. Um, groups like Catalyst, Persistent, Catapult, like groups like that, these have become the biggest, the most, the most active investors in Africa at this point are investing both cash as well as human capital into companies. So you're gonna see human capital. Equity is what we always know, is selling shares in your company for cash. And then something to really keep in mind with climate tech is a lot of climate tech, climate tech, climate, a lot of climate tech has a need for debt. So again, if you're gonna finance an asset like a, a motorbike, a solar panel, a battery, these are assets that are cash flowing that ideally should be funded with debt. And then this new thing, carbon, like what is carbon? Well, carbon in a lot of ways could be an entire business model, but for a lot of companies, it is effectively a new revenue stream. It's a new way to fund your business. And so I won't go through every single piece here. We're gonna go through a bit more detail, but if you're building a climate tech business, equity is not the only piece, which is a, is a blessing, right? So let's look at plan A and plan B. If you're building a FinTech company in Africa, the top part probably applies to you. You're gonna go out and you're gonna raise equity. That's most likely the only capital that you can raise or the only capital you have access to. In terms of climate tech, thinking about, okay, how am I going to now build my business through these stages of maturity? You're likely getting grant, human, equity, debt, and carbon. And what I want really everyone to notice here is one, it is a bit more complex. Two, it is way more innovative and creative. And three, what you're gonna get is what's called equity leverage, right? So let's think about this. Let's just say at that pre-seed moment. So Michael recently raised his pre-seed round. So in this specific case on the screen right now, in a fintech environment, you might only be raising $250,000 of capital. It's all equity, it's all pretty expensive. You're all making a big promise about how much you can deliver over the next couple of years. Within a blended capital, within a blended capital stack, at that pre-seed round, you might be raising $1.25 million of capital with only 250K of that being equity. So basically every $1 of equity is worth $6 of overall capital because you're raising a grant, because you're getting some human capital, you're getting some assistance on your business, you likely could be bringing in some debt. That could be uh, a revenue-based financing. That could be, it could be actually like a term loan. And then ideally you're starting to monetize some carbon. So a lot of businesses in Africa working in climate, whether it is EV or solar, um, ag, are hopefully at pre-seed could even have a little bit of carbon revenue. So as you see, as you start to move through the stages of development of a, of a climate tech startup, you're getting more and more leverage on your money. So for every for an equity investor, that's wonderful. I put in one dollar and I get six dollars of return, if you will. For and we'll talk about why this matters for entrepreneurs and investors. But keep this in mind: at every stage of this journey, and ideally starting at pre-seed, even ideally starting at bootstrap, you want to be blending capital. If you don't, this thing's going to be really hard. Don't wait too long to do this. Why does it matter? And let's get really, really tactical here. And again, if you have questions, please ask. There's no dumb questions. Some of this stuff is, is pretty complicated in terms of how it works, but it's very easy once we talk through it. First and foremost, as we saw in the previous example, it can extend your runway. It can extend the amount of capital that you have. So in that, ex that um, example, we had about 250K of equity. Okay, great, that's nice. But what if I could get $1.25 million of capital? that's even better. That's going to give me more runway. If you're selling less equity, you're making less promises. If you go out to raise a million dollars of equity, that's going to be a very different set of expectations than raising $250,000 of equity. You might have less investors you have to make promises to. So really keep that in mind. When you sell equity, you make a big promise. And usually that promise is pretty expensive. So the less equity you can sell for a number of reasons, the better. Um, as an investor looking to get decent IRRs, decent, decent rates of return on my investment, climate tech is pretty hard. So in order to, to increase my return profile, now every dollar that I put in increases the amount of capital in the business, I get leverage on my money. So from the entrepreneur perspective, it's better. You have longer runway, you're making less promises. From the investor standpoint, I now get, same thing, I get there's more money in the business, every $1 I put in is now worth more. 
from Michael or any other founder's perspective, it minima minimizes the amount of dilution. If you were to go out and sell $1.25 million of equity, first of all, again, making big promises, but second of all, selling more shares. If you're only selling 250 to get to 1.25 million of capital, your dilution is less, which also allows you to be more flexible in your pricing. So especially in the market right now, and I will say April, for, for African VC, April was the worst month for VC funding in African VCs since 2021. It's very hard to raise capital right now. I'm going to be very honest. So it's even more important to be able to blend your capital, be smart about how you're doing this. And when you go to market, to be able to go to market at a valuation for your company that makes sense. Valuations are coming down. So if you go to market and say, I need to sell at a $5 million post money valuation, the odds are it might not happen. If you say, okay, I'm gonna to go to market and sell shares at a two and a half million dollar post money valuation, the odds of you being able to get that deal done are much better. And when you're blending capital, you have more flexibility in that, that, that pricing. It doesn't matter as much if it's two and a half or five because you're not selling as many shares. Amazingly enough, by bringing things like debt and carbon and grant providers into your capital structure, it enforces you to have good internal processes. You have to have good financial reporting. You have to have a good database for your carbon. If you're reporting to a grant funder, you have to know what you're doing. So weirdly enough, because most early stage startups don't really have a board, they may or may not be very dialed in internally by bringing in grant providers, debt providers, and by trying to sell carbon, it's going to force your company to get much more real early, which is a good thing. And you get to be creative. Like this, I wrote a piece recently that said, the African CFO has to be as creative as the CTO or anyone else, because this thing needs to be a creative experience to bring in these different types of funding. Okay, so how do we do it? It's one thing to tell you what it is, another thing to tell you the, the, uh, the, the benefits of doing it, but how do we think about this? First of all, a lot of stuff here, but if you can take anything away as well, Venture capital is the funding of a series of experiments. If you think about bootstrap to pre-seed, you're trying to run a bunch of experiments to figure out, do I have a thing? Pre-seed to seed is another set of experiments to figure out, can I scale this thing? And then seed to series A is another set of experiments. And really think about it that way. If you verify your hypotheses and your experiments work, then you get to raise the capital to move on to the next stage of experiments. So the step number one in this whole process is actually figuring out what are the metrics necessary? What are the experiments that I have to run that would show success in my business for the next 12, 18, 24 months to see if I can access the next, the next round of capital? So think really clearly about how much money do I need in order to run this experiment to see if I get a successful outcome. We can send this presentation around at the end, but this is built for Africa. Like this, this chart right here would look very different in Silicon Valley or in Europe where there is a lot more funding. So primarily testing your solution, being pre-revenue for the most part, you're going to do through bootstrapping. It's gonna be a grant, which is also part of blended capital. It might be some friends and family funding. It might be whatever you can do to be creative because most likely by the time you take your first dollar of equity, you will have to be post-revenue. That means you're starting to validate a solution. It means you're starting to get some real traction in terms of what you're doing. And then you might start bringing in some equity. You might start bringing in some debt. You might be able to bring in some carbon. So that is that like pre-seed to seed stage. And then as you really start to solve that customer problem and start to do it at scale, now you're talking about real venture capital and real strategic debt. You're getting towards seed and series A. So think of it again as a series of experiments. If you're building your startup today, ask where am I in this process? If you're pre-revenue, still testing a customer problem, still testing an idea, you might be in this first set and you might be looking for grant funding. You might be looking for some human capital. If you have validated your solution and now you're starting to get a bit of sales growth, you might start thinking about selling some equity. You might start thinking about raising some debt or monetizing some carbon. And if you're really starting to see this thing take off, and if you really could look an investor in the eye and say, hey, if you give me a dollar, I think get you five or ten dollars within a couple of years, then you're probably really talking about growth equity or venture capital and really bringing in some debt. So really think about where, where am I in my journey and how much funding do I really need in order to get to the next level of experiments? That's step one. Step two, blend that capital. So again, if nothing else, if you walk away with this, think in your, in your own mental model, all capital has a different return profile. This is what Akif was mentioning earlier. So if you can assume in your model that a grant is effectively a zero cost of capital, that's great. 
if you think about human capital, so if Holocene's working with you, we may end up earning some equity in your company, but the cost of that's probably gonna be less. So think of that as almost a five to 10% cost of capital. Debt, usually in Africa, you're talking about 10 to 20% plus, plus interest and plus a lot of the stuff that goes on there. Less expensive than equity, but still pretty expensive. And then equity is very expensive. So if you are building your own financial model internally, if you're thinking about what's called a weighted average cost of capital, when you start to bring, up, bring all these things together and blend finance, you start to bring down the overall cost of your capital, especially if you time these things the right way. So how much money do I need is step one. And then step two is thinking about what is the ideal mix of capital? So I need a million bucks. Okay, cool. What are the ways to get to that million? It's not just gonna be selling a million of equity. Again, you're gonna make big promises. The valuation needs to be really high and it's gonna be very expensive. For a million bucks, maybe it's 250 of, or 500K of grant, 100K of human capital, a little bit of equity, a little bit of debt. So be creative in how you do that. The last piece here is really to think about the ideal strategy. And this is at least my experience. So you've now thought about how much capital do I need? What are the types of capital available in the market? The best case scenario is you can start with a grant. So if you can get bring in grant funding that's aligned with your mission, you don't wanna take a grant that is not doing anything you wanna do, but if you can find a grant that lets you test the hypothesis, lets you get to market, lets you talk to your customers, lets you get some good data to figure out, is this a thing that's ideal? That grant can then allow you to have enough data to bring in a human capital provider like Holocene or Catalyst or Persistent or Delta 40, because what we need is some data. We actually need you to be able to do something so we can help you along in that journey. So ideally that human capital comes with a little bit of cash as well. We can throw in some human capital as well as some equity. If you are now starting to get some traction, you've used your grant, you've leveraged human capital, now you can start thinking about raising equity. But even when you go out to raise equity, if you've already talked to a debt provider and a debt provider says, hey, I'll bring in debt if you can find the equity, that's really nice because the equity investor wants to know that you're gonna cover your hardware, your working capital with something besides equity. And again, it makes every dollar of equity worth more. So if you can go to a debt provider and say, hey, you're probably not gonna invest in me right now, but would you give me an MOU? Would you give me a soft commitment that if I find a million dollars of equity, you'll put in $2 million of debt, that helps the equity investors a lot. The last piece would be carbon. So carbon is something that usually gets generated as you start selling. So it's a little bit from a timing standpoint, a little bit further along, but a great way to bring debt into your company is to have a carbon offtake. If you have someone who's willing to buy your carbon, that's a beautiful thing for someone to come in and put debt behind. So again, we'll send this out and we're happy to talk through it, but this, from my perspective, is the way to really blend finance. And this happens all the way through the different periods of pre-seed, seed, and series A. The good news is, I mean, I've been in climate tech in Africa for 10 years, and the good news is the ecosystem is specializing. So 10 years ago, you would be very hard pressed to find a grant provider, a debt provider, human capital providers. It was just like, go out and try to find money. Now investors are starting to specialize. And this is what you see in Silicon Valley and in, in Europe. So there are specific grant providers, there are human capital providers, there are large equity investors, and there are large debt investors. Knowing who these groups are, starting to communicate with them, starting to learn about their mandate, and starting to line up that strategy that, hey, I'm going to win a grant from P4G, which Michael will talk about. Michael was able to, to win a, an incredible grant from an awesome institution like P4G. He then came and worked with Holocene. Before and after that process, we were able to throw in a little bit of cash and a lot of human capital. Uh, we were able to help Michael start to line up some non-dilutive uh, debt or revenue-based financing from a group like Untapped, which is a great partner that we work with. And we were able to help Michael end up raising the equity he needed from a group called Anza Capital who led that round. So all of a sudden, being able to know who these parties are, being able to know how to bring them together becomes hypercritical in your timing. And the best time to actually go have these conversations is before you need money. Like go look at their websites, talk to these people, learn their mandates and say, hey, like when would you be ready to potentially invest in my company? I'm not asking for money today, but I'm trying to learn about your mandate and how you look at the world. The last thing is, I mean, look at advisors, like have people that help you. I mean, and I'm not saying Holocene by far is the only person willing to do this, but there's great groups out there that are specialized in this. The same way entrepreneurs are very technical in terms of engineering or software, or biochemistry, the finance side is very technical as well. And so there are groups like Holocene that could come in and really help you do this. The last piece I'll leave everybody with today is the, the best way to raise capital is to, to sell product. 
And selling product implicitly means you really understand a customer problem and you're really solving a customer problem. So for every startup out there that comes to me and says, hey, I need to raise money, my answer is probably you need to really understand a customer problem and solve that problem and get paid to do it. The number one, um, the number one in, in indicator of a successful fundraise is your sales growth. If you're selling well and your sales growth is accelerating, you will be able to raise funding or you should be able to, especially if you really think about being strategic in terms of your blended finance. So thanks for listening. We will send this presentation out today. This stuff is super critical for climate tech and we're very, very happy to have these conversations. I want to say thank you to Michael for offering his lessons learned and a key for doing great work at Convergence and hopefully it's helpful. So. Please keep your keep your questions, and I see Akif also has a question. So go for it, my friend. Thanks, Josh. This is really really, really helpful to, to hear about early stage climate finance and blended finance from from your perspective, because that's not a, a whole lot of our focus at Convergence. We're mostly focused on scale solutions, so it's good to spend time with, with organizations and folks such as yourselves. Um, my question is around you know climate tech space in Africa and how that sort of matched to what we're seeing in Silicon Valley at the moment. Um, which is, you just mentioned focus on sales growth, well as the rhetoric and discourse very much in Silicon Valley right now is profitability over sales growth. It was sales growth for a few years and now it's profitability. Um, are you seeing investors that you put on that map, are you seeing those folks also encourage startups to think of profitability or is it very much sales growth in, in, in Africa climate sector? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great clarification, yeah. thank you. Um, I mean, sales growth is not sale at any cost. I mean, sales growth is knowing your unit economics, sales growth is, so I think it's, it's a great point because historically a lot of venture capital has been sales at any cost even if the economics don't make sense acquire customers and grow um, in africa that doesn't work i don't think that ever worked maybe in in fintech and in some of that stuff you could acquire users and raise capital on that in climate tech unit economics do have to make sense so i think everything we do in africa is almost um it, ha it has to make business sense like in, on in all honesty there's not enough capital to gloss over a bad business model so thank you for the clarification there sales growth with economics that makes some sense the beautiful part about climate tech which is a really good forcing mechanism <clears throat> you won't be able to bring debt into your climate tech startup if you don't have a business model if your sales don't make sense if every sale loses you money or loses you a lot of money you can't raise debt like these things actually keep you very, very honest because no one will give you cash to fund a bad business, especially if it's looking for <laughs> for return of capital. So very good question. And I, I do think now with the funding environment becoming more difficult, um, where Silicon Valley could grow at any cost in the past, I think they're learning you have to have good unit economics. It's kind of always been that way down here for good or for bad. And, and maybe I have another question or more for thought, but what role can policy play to showcase successful models such as Michael's, hmm. which sort of articulated how you supported him with cash and sweat equity all the way to um, you know, getting him some funding from Anza. How can we sort of put these stories out there to inspire other organizations apart from just having webinars? Is there something we could put out there through a video or um, is also you sort of about kind of communicating this story? Yeah, I think I'd also love to hear from the audience today too, if anybody has um, any points here, because I mean, we are trying it through webinars like this. We have put a video out on, on social media. Um, we are trying to have these discussions much more often. Um, and I think we also want to own the fact that for, like we love working with entrepreneurs who love understand their customer, right? So I do think there are more what are called ESOs, entrepreneurial service providers in the market now. And I would highly recommend for entrepreneurs to go out and talk to those ESOs to figure out how we bring together, like help one plus one equal three. Um, but I'd actually, I'd love to throw it back at the audience for our Q&A, like how do, how do we get this message out there more? Um, one point I will make is that 2024 will be the first year in African venture capital history where climate tech will receive more capital than fintech. So fintech funding has come down, climate tech has stayed steady to gone up. And the real risk in the market is that people take a fintech um, CFO lens and bring it to climate tech and only raise equity. If you take anything away from this, if you're building a climate tech business, you have to access grants, you have to think about debt, you have to think about carbon, and ideally bringing in a, a provider that can help you leverage uh, blended finance early before you hire your full-time CEO. Love the question. I think we sent it back to the audience for our, our Q&A to see how we can get the message out there more. Okay, did you have something as well? 
Yeah, so I, I just wanted to say to the audience, so I see we, we're not that many people. So um, audience members, please uh, put up your hand, just press the little hand icon if you do have a question. So right now, Josh and Michael are going to have a conversation. And um, then afterwards, then if you had your hand up, I'm actually going to bring you guys up one by one. So if let's say Benjamin has his hand up, then I'll bring Benjamin up and then Benjamin can join the conversation, ask his question, take Benjamin off and then the next one. So um, just put your hand up if you have a question. Okay, bye. <laughs> yeah. um, cool, I think we have 15 minutes now to talk to Michael. And Michael, maybe I'll, I'll just turn it over to you and always want to come from the entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about Zimmy, about your journey, and maybe get into a little bit about how Blended Finance has maybe helped your business. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Josh, and thanks so much for having having me. Um, so yeah, first off, Zimi, we're uh, electric vehicle charging software and hardware. Uh, we work with commercial fleets in logistics, field services, um, to really help make their transition to electric vehicles as seamless as possible. So about myself, I studied engineering. I'm an engineer. I worked for many years in product management, so working with with startups and with early stage companies in building product, mainly in the software space, but also in interacting with hardware, and really learned a lot about what it means to experiment with products, work with customers, uh, build solutions essentially, and, and deploy it to market. So if you think of me, you think of me as someone who's really experienced in, in building new products and launching them to market. I've always been very passionate about entrepreneurship and starting a business, so when I had the experience of working at a digital bank that had a strong carbon focus. I really thought, thought of what could I do to leverage my skills and my experience to go and build something that's actually making an impact, right? So something that's really going to help us reduce our carbon, uh, reach our net zero goals, and just have a sustainable climate, essentially, for, for the rest, rest of the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, looked into, looked into the problems that were being faced by uh, by fleets and by companies looking to switch to electric vehicles and, and started there. So yeah, it's a short intro. I think in terms of uh, blended capital, I mean, yeah, Josh, I'm, I'm sure we can dive into some some of the, the, the steps in the journey, but when you, when you build a business which has both, let's say, a software and a hardware component, um, it's really critical to think about how much capital you're going to need to get enough runway to run these experiments. Exactly what you said, right? So you need time to build, you need time to explore, you need time to test your hypotheses, right? When you're working with, with uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, and it's, you know, every person's situation is different um, and you definitely want to focus on bootstrapping as long as possible. But at a certain point, you have to take the plans, right? You have to cover at least for yourself a small salary or, you know, you need to get this developer on board or you need to, you know, launch this marketing campaign. So let me, let me kind of there because like, yeah. I want to, if, if for entrepreneurs out there, I think Michael did a phenomenal job of bootstrapping. Um, maybe just talk us through like that bootstrapping period for, for you and Zimmy. Like what, what were you hmm. searching for? How did you fund yourself? When did you know you started to have something that you may want to raise capital mm. for like because bootstrapping is hypercritical in Africa period where there's mm. less capital and I think in the environment we're in now people are going to really have to get creative here but I hate telling people bootstrap without giving them examples so I think your yeah, perfect examples here might be really helpful yeah so I think like I'd in the past tried to start businesses with let's say co-founders or with friends where we always tried to be quite ambitious and we tried to build something which we couldn't build ourselves so when I started Zimi I deliberately chose something which I knew I could build myself. I know how to code. I know how the hardware works. You know, I'm not the best coder, <laughs> but I, I can hack things together. Um, and I deliberately just went and let's say bought a charger. I tried to hack, hack a charger in my spare time. Literally, I'm still having a full-time job, still working, getting a salary, um, weekends, evenings, playing with that, figuring out how that works. That's like step one, just kind of figure out how the product and the, and the tech works. I was lucky enough that I was able to negotiate with my employer at that stage a bit of a part-time relationship, right? So one day a week, I'll take a, I'll take a cut in salary, but I get this day that I can work on my business and told them I'm working on my business. They're, they're also a, a venture builder, so they're quite supportive of, of my journey as well, which I was quite lucky, uh, fortunate um, uh, in. So I started doing that one day a week um, and used that time to really go and figure out how, how am I going to, I, I realize, cool, I need to raise funds. At some point, you know, I, I have to build something with a team. Um, I have to cover my own salary uh, and really was fortunate enough to, to get introduced to, to Holocene and really 
uh, kind of have that conversation around, cool, I need to raise funds, but how do I get, close that gap between where I'm right now, I'm starting having these early stage conversations with customers into actually expanding the team and scaling, right? And that was kind of the gap that, that you and Ian Duval and the team really filled for us. That's kind of a bit more of a practical insight into, into how it worked uh, yeah. for my journey. It's usually helpful though. I think, I mean, for one thing, everyone thinks they need to take the plunge and quit their job and like go all in. I love the fact that you stayed employed and you started tinkering and for, first of all, something you were passionate about. So, so right, something you're curious about, something you're passionate about, something you haven't earned insight. Like you were working in a field, like you said, you understood it, you wanted to learn more, but it wasn't completely blue sky to you or something you, you were working in. Yeah, I think, you, sorry, you know, just, to, no, just to add to that, I mean, I also, uh, you know, over the over time I'd saved up some of my own capital to put into the business. So just for those initial kind of R&D type of things, just to get some of some of the things going. And also very fortunate to have worked with my co-founder, Stefan Nell, who, um, who we studied together, uh, good friends, and, and I convinced him to also jump into the business. So, but our idea was always to use that capital Capital really for that early customer discovery, that early product development, trying to keep operational expenditure as low as possible for as long as possible um, until we got to a point where we could get more cash in the business. And, and Beautiful. And this is where, I mean, you are trying to get as much learning as possible to figure out something. So uh, something like customer discovery is free, right? So doing desk research, going out and talking to customers, I mean, or potential customers learning about the needs, mm -hmm. um, using your own skills, and then running that set of experiments. And then I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Michael. Then there is a moment when you say, I think I have something. Basically, you went to access human capital. Holocene provided a little bit of financial capital, but primarily uh, human capital to help bridge that gap from I think I have something to I need to raise funding. That is a perfect space yeah. for a human capital provider to come in. So maybe if you now, not just specific to Holocene, but talk mm. about for technical entrepreneurs, maybe the skills they would need or the, the other mm. teammates they would need to get from I have something to the big kind of pre-seed round. Yeah, excellent. I'll kind of verse it as a problem, right? So what I'd done before I'd met you and you and the team was I decided, Stefan and I, we said, okay, cool, we're gonna go and raise, we're gonna raise capital. We're gonna figure out how to do this ourselves, right? And I took a bit of a business development approach and I went and I listed a big long spreadsheet with all of the funders. I went every venture capital funder, South Africa, Africa, Europe, you know, anybody, everybody that I could list, right? It's I had a list of like 100 or 200 uh, 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 um, funds. And I just went and I contacted every single one of them. It was terrible. I just went and I sent emails. I got in, you know, I did actually get some intros, which was fantastic. Like I was able to get some, some introductions. Um, I applied to every single grant. I applied to every single pitching competition. You know, it was like, it, it was really a bit of, it was a, a massive slog. And the success rate was terrible. Like, to be honest with you, like, okay, I got into a couple of pitch competitions, you know, but that's relatively simple. Um, you know, got some interviews with some funders, but they didn't know how to talk to them. They didn't know what it was that they were looking for. So from not ever having raised capital, sure, I can build product, I can talk to customers, I can build a business, but it's an entirely different skill set that you need. And in working with a, uh, let's say with an organizational acceleration program where you can be taught a what does your business need to look like like what does your business need to look like from a metric standpoint what are you raising for that's quite an important thing like what are you raising funds for and then how do you qualify funders right so not everybody invests in everyone right funders have very specific mandates in in, in who they fund and what they fund and where they fund um, and really understanding that quite accurately just saves you so much time and just increases your success rate significantly. That's awesome. And then, yeah, again, thinking from the investor side, having someone come to you with something that you can really potentially invest in, right? Saving you, knowing what you, an investor is also your customer. On one side, Michael is trying to sell a charger, a charging solution to a fleet. On the other side, he's trying to sell shares to an investor. And those are two different problems, but you're Definitely. solving someone's problem on both sides. The investor has an IRR, and some kind of some sort of investor they also have to please so understanding i think that's what a lot of human capital providers can help you understand is like what does good look like for pre-seed mm. and the like so mm. and maybe michael if you talk us through so now you've been you've been bootstrapping you've been testing you've been learning you've been doing your customer discovery you bring in some human capital you did win some pitch competitions that's another thing to bring up mm. so winning some funding for pitching or for grants whatever else um, and now you're starting to get a little bit of traction. Maybe you now walk us through 
that moment of getting to that big pre-seed mm -hmm. raise? Like, what did that look like, both mm -hmm. from the business standpoint as well as the splendid finance standpoint? Yeah, definitely. So I think what, what I found so interesting was, was that there is actually quite a method, methodological process you could follow to do this, right? So I wasn't on the wrong track by building up a database and pitching to, to investors, but the way in which you do that has to be quite specific. So we worked quite actively, first of all, in understanding, you know, what, like, what are you raising for? Like, first of all, just figure that out, that you can do by understanding, you know, are you entering a new market? Are you trying to build product? Like, what are you trying to do exactly? What does your team look like typically? What does that team cost you? Team cost will probably be your highest expense, right? Um, also, if you're looking at, let's say, hardware, which is a part of our solution, you know, what type of offering are you going to put in the market from a finance or a lease perspective? Because that's going to kind of give you an idea of your debt. And then kind of work your way backwards from there, right? Okay, cool. I need a million, let's say, you know, the amounts you use, let's say $500,000. I need $500,000. I want to deploy a ring to own solar company, as an example. Okay. Go and find or create a database of the funders, work with the, you know, the acceleration program where you're working with to understand who would be immediately off the bat qualified for that type of funding, right? Like who would be interested in this? Who, 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 whose mandates do you fit in this kind of specific, specific type of, of raise? Um, and then get yourself prepared. Like it's, <laughs> you have to make sure that for like, you know, have a, like we work very in a very, very diligent to create a very detailed pitch deck, a summarized pitch deck. We did online an online pitch. We recorded that, tended that as a takeaway to to investors. And then, what's the quote you said, Josh? Turning over stones. You just have to keep following up. You just have to keep checking. You have to make sure that you can get a get a no quickly. Like if somebody's you know ask you know it's like sales like if, <laughs> is this something you'd be interested in is this in your do you have funds that, you know is this something that you, you'd be willing to take a plunge on so um we just did that for a very long time and, and luckily enough yeah ended up closing the round i think what i want to add there too for the entrepreneurs out there is remember that you are sell you're solving a problem for an investor the problem you're solving for a grant provider is very different than the problem you're solving for an equity investor is very different than you're solving for a debt investor um, i think michael did a great job like if you have your say 12 to 15 slide pitch deck the middle seven to eight slides are probably the same for most investors but you definitely want to tailor your deck to the specific investor if you go to a debt investor with an equity deck it's going to be the wrong deck if you go mm -hmm. to a grant provider with the equity deck it's the wrong you're, mm -hmm. you're selling the wrong problem so or solving the wrong problem so remember I think it's really important and, and investors will give you a lot of credibility if you've done your research and you say, hey, um, debt investor, I've looked at your mandate. I know you invest in Africa at this stage. I think I understand how your, your debt works. Build the pitch deck that way and be able to say, here's how I'm going to get your money back. Or for a grant provider, I've looked at what you want to do and I know you want to scale impact. Here's how I'm going to do that. Like speak to the person's mandate. Show you've done your desk research, right? Show you've put the work in. And Michael, if you don't mind, I mean, now we'll open up to the audience in a minute or two. Maybe if you talk about now as you've raised your pre-seed and you've basically earned your opportunity to, to run the next set of experiments, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. how was raising a blended finance at pre-seed helpful for Zimmy and how you think about the runway to run those next set of experiments? Mm -hmm. And then maybe how are, how's it going? Like how, How's the set of experiments going? It would always be fun. Yeah, definitely. So I think... A, a, a kind of just something to add to the previous point also was, you know, it's, it's not just a pitch deck, it's also a very detailed financial model. So when you're working on, on fundraising, you really have to make sure that your unit economics and your, your company economics make sense, right? So I still remember in working with Duval the first time, I was extremely proud of my spreadsheet and he just like gave me a look like, sure, Michael, <laughs> I'll show you, I'll show you how to do that now. And I think now it's Stefan and myself. I mean, we're so much more advanced than, than that, that, that start. So I think that's also just an important point is to make sure that that, that type of modeling is also quite sound. Um, yeah, so I think something that was really interesting that I learned was, you know, the, the idea around weighted average cost of capital. Basically, you know, let's, let's look at, I, I, know, I know you added in human capital and carbon, but let's just look at it from like grant equity uh, and debt, right? And, and each one of them has a different cost. And by blending that, your, your average cost is just lower, right? So it's good to, to, get, to, get, a, to get a combination of that. I think for us also, um, you know, we were specifically raising for, for scaling our team, for product building and for commercialization, right? So we'd done early experiments, we'd gotten some early traction, 
Um, we kind of, you know, got in the economic buyers to say, yes, this is something I'd be willing to buy. And now we had to formalize the solution and go out to market. So what the Razor really enabled us to do was to scale our team. So we've grown from two to eight team members. We've got office space. We've been able to solidify some of our product offerings. Um, and we've been able to kind of scale commercialization, get into the conversations, get into the rooms with the stakeholders and the businesses that, we, that we're solving the problems for. And also more recently, we started expanding our digital solutions overseas, outside of South Africa. So it's really been a massive enabler for the business. I think something that's been really critical for us also is building because you're building a quite a close partnership, right? You know, with, with your grant funder, with your debt funder, with your with your investors. And what that actually means is it just stacks the odds in your favor, right? You have more, your network is bigger, right? Like now, if I want to talk to a logistics provider in the Netherlands, I have 10 more people that I can go by <laughs> via to get a warm intro, right? So that even makes makes our commercialization success uh, potentially even better. Um, it really gets us more opportunities, right? If I'm thinking of the next raise, you know, the seed round, we've been through it now. We kind of understand what we need to do in the next in the next phase, and we've got really tangible proof of what we've been able to achieve. And what would, what could we do with your money in the next round, right? So I think it's it's been such a massive enabler for us, and yeah, just excited to see how it goes. Yeah, yeah thanks, Michael. And I, and I do want to open it up to to audience Q and A now. But I would just add, I mean, again, as Michael starts near the seed, like so, you you earn the opportunity to have more time to prove out the experiment to see what's going to happen next. You now get to go to these seed investors and say, on the debt side, now we're accessing a million dollars of debt. We might be winning another grant. We might be monetizing carbon here on the equity side. Here's how this thing's working. So again, I think it's just a, a great example of how we blend, how we bootstrap to be clear, mm -hmm. like how do we get gritty? How do we really understand a problem? How are we super passionate about something? Secondly, how do we wait till the right time to bring in some human capital? And then lastly, how do we make sure that we blend these different types of, types of capital together? And I want to echo Michael's last point there is that you then, the one thing I actually didn't think about, and you made a great point there, Michael, is now you have more ambassadors, right? If you're only selling equity to one investor, you have one person who's really rooting for you and helping you in your journey with a grant provider, human capital, equity, debt, you now have, you've multiplied your ambassador effect by five or 10. And in small ecosystems like Africa, all of a sudden you, your investors probably know everyone, like right within that, they're probably <laughs> gonna get to anyone else in the ecosystem pretty quickly, build on trust and build on those connections. So yeah, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. And hopefully for the audience, it just be, makes it more tangible, right? Like this stuff is real. This is how entrepreneurs are using it. Um, so yeah, thanks Kay. Definitely wanna open up to any questions and appreciate everybody listening. And thanks Michael for your insights. Thanks so much, Josh. Okay, we've got one. Cool. Prever. Okay, and then I'm going to unmute Prever. Yeah, Prever, I think you can do that from your side now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, brilliant. I feel honored to, to not be a viewer anymore. Um, <laughs> There's a, a question I think, and this is more towards convergence side is, is so let's say you've gone through this through the startup phase and you're doing well and, and so now you're looking at, at really scaling and, and for that you need significant capital. Um, I, I'd be interested to know kind of what is the corporate structuring or what kind of tools do you have in that sense to, to meet the need of, and as you put it, the risk and reward profile is, is different depending on who your your so outside of just simply having shares or, or having a simple loan with, with the required return, like what, how, how do you structure these transactions so that you actually can give someone different risk and, and reward profiles? Sorry, could you repeat the second half of that question right. again? I lost you in my right ear. <laughs> Sorry. So, so just what, what kind of tools are available for you to actually get to the point where you can offer different risk reward um, profiles to different investors? Yeah, so it, it again, depends on, on, on the kind of organization you are. So if it depends on if you're an individual organization, if you're setting up a fund that invests in a range of other organizations. So one tool, as an example, could be a guarantee. A guarantee is a great way to shift risks to somebody else uh, who is willing to take it or reduce the gap between the perception of risk and the reality of risk. So let's say 
um, at a much later stage in the life cycle of climate tech organizations, maybe you know, startups anymore, but you're more mature, uh, you now need to access bank capital. The banks are unwilling to lend, you know, still early, relatively early days. How do we get the banks to lend more? So you can have, for example, the Swedish International Development Agency come along or USDFC come along, which is the development finance arm of the US government and say, okay, you know what? Ned Bank or First Rand Bank or all the other banks in South Africa, we would love you to see you more, to lend more on the climate tech space. We're going to guarantee half of your loan book so that you can lend to entrepreneurs like Michael and others. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is in, let's say you're raising um, a, a, a debt from a, from a range of different investors. You could have four or five different investors coming together and you could have more concessional investors say, I will be the first one to get wiped out in case this organization goes under or in case there's any delays in payments. So there's a delay in payment. These other three or four people will get the payments first. And then I will sort of sacrifice my payment to a later stage. Or if you're on the equity side of the business, uh, if there's certain internal rates of returns that I need to hit, my IRR can be capped and everything that the business spits up, out over and above that can go to more senior investors. Um, or another way is to say um, you, you have, and this is what I've seen, you have various different investors uh, give out what they call pay for success loans. They'll essentially give your business a loan and they'll say, okay, well, I'm pricing it at X, but it's going to be X minus Y if you go out and hit certain impact metrics so that now my incentive and your incentives are aligned because we're both focused on development impact. So viability gap funding, pay for success, guarantees, first loss, um, a preferred return structure when it comes to equity. These are the few different ways in which you can alter that risk return that I was talking about earlier. Uh, to Brewer. So like one of the things to think about, and I wish there was more, more creative, I won't say more creative, but what we end up seeing over and over again is an operating company and a financing company. So if you think about say Michael's business at scale, um, I mean, in the end, what we want to do is match investor risk and return and different investors have different risk and return hurdles and what they want to do. So what we'll see over time is most companies start to become operating companies and financing companies. So at scale, let's just say Michael and Zimmy is an operating company. There's an investor who may come in and take that operating risk. They'll put equity in the business and say, OK, cool, I'm, I'm cool with these operations. A bank doesn't want that risk. They don't want the risk that Michael's team isn't going to make enough sales. That's what equity is about. They want to finance the, the chargers. Like they actually want to finance either the loans or the working capital. So now you're separating operating risk from financing risk. That's an asset versus an operations of a company. And you'll see this happen over and over again. You'll start to split Opco from Finco and bring in different investors who some of them want to fund Opco, some of them want to fund Finco. To Akif's point there, the Finco can they get, get a bit nuanced and who sits where in the capital structure within the Finco. Um, so think about that. Like as your company scales, is there an operating aspect and a financing aspect? The other point would be joint ventures. So let's just say, for instance, Michael does want to go to Europe. Well, he can spend a bunch of money to open up a new company in Europe, but maybe he's going to partner with someone in Europe who's going to bring capital and you do a joint venture. That's actually another way to be really creative in terms of blended finance. You get someone to pay you to bring your tech to a new market. They might bring the equity, you bring the IP, and everyone now is better for that. So there are different creative ways to, to think about separating risk and return and then meeting the needs of investors for those specific types of risk and return. And just to make one, another point as well, a bit broader, is that when we talk to investors to mobilize them into startups in Africa, let's call it broadly, and then climate tech startups as a subsector, most investors, at least the ones that are sitting outside and have the most capital in the global north, don't want to take the risk of just one particular startup. Me as an investor, I'd much rather put my money into a fund. That fund is diversified across eight or 10 different startups in three or four different countries. And it could have an Africa flavor, it could have a Southern Africa flavor. That way I have diversified rather than concentrating all my risk into one particular institution or organization. So what you're seeing is the, the large money is mobilized into portfolio structures and the portfolio managers are the ones who you should be interacting with and engaging with and not so much worrying about who their investors are because that's their job to handle. And, 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 and so primarily those investors don't even know 
uh, too much about about climate debt, right? They, they they're giving it the money to to experts who who have a sense of, of what, what what's going on. So that's also another way to think about it, and it's another way to separate the kinds of investors you're speaking with. Okay, I'm gonna take Brevard off, and then. Is there anyone else in the audience that has a question? You can just raise your hand. Jace, okay, cool. Let me just quickly, I'm going to pull you up, Jace. Um, yeah, hold on. Yes, cool. Aloha. <laughs> How are you? Um, my question is around human capital. Uh, I'm not too familiar with regards to what services or human capital entails. Can you perhaps just outline what that involves and yeah, how does it work? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this is, this is a fast growing industry, right? I think the realization all around the world. So Y Combinator is human capital, Startup Bootcamp is human capital. I mean, the realization a long time ago was that early stage, for one, there is a pattern for how to start a company. There's learned insights and in how you can most accelerate the early stages of your company. But then specifically in Africa, the most active investors in Africa are adding equity as well as human capital. It's just really necessary at these early stages. So the, the big thing to think about if you're an entrepreneur considering human capital is almost like what need do I have? So as you heard Michael say, he was coming more from the technology side. So he felt pretty good on the technology, but he maybe needed some finance assistance or some assistance on the financial modeling or thinking about the, the customer segment. Um, so he was looking for more of a commercial partner to help him think about his business, to help fundraise, to help work on the sales. Um, that's something at Holocene specifically, we work on primarily fundraising, sales, culture, hiring, things like that. You're going to find other uh, human capital providers like, uh, say, the Delta, Specno, others that are going to be more focused on products, right? Like if I was going to build a business, I don't know how to do what Michael does. So I would need to find someone who's pretty technical. I might say, hey, I have this great idea. I think I can sell this thing. Could you help me build the prototype? Could you help me build whatever that thing is? So it might be a technical service provider. So at least for me, those are the two big sides is like commercial versus technical. And generally, those human capital providers are coming in and, and filling a hole in your company. You can almost think of them as like a variable cost teammate, right? Like you can't hire that teammate. You don't have enough money. Ideally, that teammate will throw in a little bit of cash and a lot of expertise to help build out something that you just don't internally have the resources to do. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Okay. Maybe if no one has a question, I'll also mention um, that Convergence has a grant pool Ooh. wherein we provide grants to early stage innovative financial concepts or financial structures um, that are blended and have that potentially have the propensity to go on and to raise additional private capital. So it could be um, a fund manager that's coming up with a kind of tech fund that's blended that wants to test it out for proof of concept or feasibility studies. So we'll give them a grant to, to pay for themselves and to do the, do the uh, financial modeling, legal support, and so on. Um, if you are an entrepreneur and you are designing, let's say, a hold code that's blended, um, that's something that potentially we would fund as well. Most of our funds, and that's just a function of the donors, most of our funds are focused on some sort of climate in intersectionality, so climate and gender, or we have a, a Climate Tech Asia fund. Um, so we'll be happy to to support um, or to hear from any of you, and I'll put the link in the chat box so that you can look at who we've supported in the past. I think we've given about 45 grants in the past, gone to mobilize around a billion and a half uh, in US dollars, um, and then you can also see the various windows that we have open. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. So. Okay. Anything else from you, Josh or Michael? I just want to say thanks. I want to say thanks for everyone for coming out, asking great questions for the other presenters here for, yeah, really, I think 
it's a hypercritical topic that most people don't maybe understand or are scared to get into. So I want to thank everybody for making it very approachable today. And again, I mean, this is a community. This is an ecosystem. Let's help build it together. I think to Akib's point earlier, like help us get the message out there. This thing is super important and it's really, really necessary. So help us spread the message. And, and thanks for the time. And thank yes. you, Kayla and Josh, for putting this together. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. So um, just to our audience, so I will send both Josh's presentation and Akif's presentation, as well as the recording of this uh, of this session. So I'll send it now, next 45 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.